All right, friends, it's time to give you loyal listeners a discount on protein powder. You may or may not know, but I launched my very first protein powder two years ago. It's a grass-fed beef isolate with only three ingredients, grass-fed beef, either organic cacao or organic vanilla, and organic monk fruit. Now, if you don't want any of the added flavor and sweeteners, you can also just get unflavored. And no matter what flavor you choose, you're getting over 23 grams of protein per scoop, which is gonna keep you full and satisfied between meals. I love starting my day with a Fab Four smoothie and breaking my fast with that much protein. It makes a serious difference in my cravings and blood sugar balance the rest of the day, and I've seen it with my clients as well. Now, I never thought I'd own a product company, but when I got pregnant with Sebastian, I realized the majority of protein powders were chemically extracted or enzymatically extracted, and I wanted to use heat and water only. I wanted minimal ingredients because we don't need those emulsifiers, fillers, or added vitamins, minerals, and probiotics. All of those additions increase the chances that it's not gonna work for your body, whether it be bloating, digestion issues. I just wanted pure clean protein to keep you full and satisfied so you could build the most delicious Fab Four smoothie. And I have to say, I'm pretty proud of the flavor. If you take a look at our reviews on Amazon, you'll see five-star reviews for flavor. And that is key because if you don't love your Fab Four smoothie and you don't love drinking your protein powder, you're not gonna do it. It won't become a habit and it's consistency that outpaces everything. So. If you're here and you're listening and you want to give our protein powder a try, use the code PODCAST5 for $5 off your order. And let me know if you love it. My favorite ways to apply this protein powder is in my Fab Four smoothie, making freezer fudge, making chocolate milk, making hot chocolate, and throwing the unflavored into all my kids' baked goods. So let me know how you use it. Let me know if you love it. And share this podcast deal with your friends. Laura Conley is a mother, entrepreneur, host of the Yummy Mummy podcast and weight loss coach. After struggling with yo-yo dieting for 20 years, Laura cracked the code on her own personal wellness approach. She quit counting calories and began to truly enjoy her food and feel great. It is now her mission to help other women discover the freedom she has found and show them that it is possible to love food, love your body and do it without struggle. Laura, I'm so excited to have you on the show. We've been friends for years and it's so fun to watch you build your business and just exude so much brightness and positivity. So thank you for spending the morning with me. Oh my God. Thank you for having me. And the brightness and positivity is like such a reflection of who you are. I feel like (laughs) there's so much right on this Zoom camera. It's so much brightness and energy and love and sparkles. (laughs) Well, I think you've been this way from the beginning, way back when we met. Remember, we sat down, you and me and a couple of your girlfriends, just to talk about health and nutrition. And you were teaching yoga and we were all kind of in the same space. So can you tell me about your experience? What brought you to the world of wellness? And how did you get started? Yeah, it's such a good question. Well, I think I've been on this quest since high school, probably this health and wellness and um, honestly, weight quest, because I think, I don't know, maybe sophomore or junior year of high school, I started just watching my weight and I started just watching what I was eating. And I think I was really getting what our culture wants us to get part of our culture wants us to get, right? That thin equaled worthy, that skinny equaled good. And I was getting this programming and this messaging, even though my mom was such a good role model. Um, But I started at that time to count calories. I'll never forget. I'd come home from school, write down my calories before I went to bed, write down my calories. And it's like, if it was under a thousand calories, it was good. And I was just from then on, married to that constant counting. And um, I think my struggle um, started or kind of increased when I went to college. I like gained the quintessential freshman 15. So I was always like thin in high school. But then in college, I started to actually struggle with my weight and um, gained exactly 15 pounds. And then I think over the next 20 some years gained and lost that same 15 pounds, probably 15 times, right? I was just like your 
textbook yo-yo diet. I would try everything. I would do any cleanse, any Weight Watchers program, any new blah, blah, blah. I was always the friend, right? That was con. They're like, oh, you're on a diet again? My poor husband, because I've been in with him since freshman year of college. So he's seen me go through the ups and downs. And after college, um, I continued to struggle just with gaining and losing. I felt like I could be thin or be in what I thought was my natural body, but I'd be starving myself. I would be right eating that 800 or 900 calories that just was not sustainable because inevitably I would throw in the towel on whatever the diet was. And then I would be overeating and be also not at my natural weight, right? Like I was just... I I describe it as I was kind of like a little chubby, a little chunky, um, which that was just how I kind of saw myself. Um, There's nothing wrong or bad about any weight. I do want to say that. Um, But I just didn't feel comfortable in my skin. And I knew I was also not eating healthy. So when I was quote unquote overweight for myself, I knew I wasn't putting healthy food into my body, right? Like I was overeating on the weekends and snacking a lot in terms of um, during the weekend at night with food that didn't actually serve me, but I could never find this middle ground, right? And so I left corporate America in 2012 and became a yoga teacher and meditation teacher and then coach and started to do a lot of coaching on helping women remove the golden handcuffs, right? So this is like this idea of you're in corporate America and you have a decent job. It's kind of cushy, but it's not your calling. It's not really what you want to do, but it's really hard to leave because of the financial component of the insurance component. (laughs) Oh, the company car, the 401k, yeah. the expense account. <laughs> Literally all of the things. The yeah. easy relationships. You're like, ah, yeah. Yeah. PO here, a PO there. <laughs> I'm good. What, what vacation are we going to take? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I remember my dad being like, wait a second. What? You're going to leave your job in pharmaceutical sales to be a yoga teacher? Like, what is happening? Everyone else was really supportive. And my dad was super supportive too, but he was just, you know, more old school. My dad had the same reaction. Yeah. (laughs) So I, um, so I left corporate America and started helping women do the same, right? Take off the proverbial golden handcuffs so that they could go do what they really wanted. And I was doing a lot of coaching and, you know, we connected during this time a lot over vision and goals. So it helped women help you know, create what is it that they want in the first place and how to go get it, um, which was really fun. This whole time though, in the background, I'm kind of silently struggling with gaining and losing weight, still yo-yoing, still trying this diet and that diet. Part of me, you know, would pretend to love my body, but I didn't really love my body unless it was at a certain number, right? And so it was like this on again, off again relationship with my body. And I think what was kind of screwy about the whole thing, which is I was also teaching yoga and meditation, but I was judging myself against a lot of other yoga teachers. Like yoga teachers are supposed to be like thin and wafy. And that's not what I looked like some of the time. Some of the time I did. (laughs) Yeah. I was going to say that's, it's so, it's so interesting just because being in the yoga scene in LA, it's, it's true. I mean, you just have these, not only are they yoga instructors, they're aspiring actors and models who are going out for auditions on their downtime and um, maybe didn't grow up with parents who brought a lot of food around or maybe they got really good at restricting or maybe that's their natural set weight. And there's just so much comparison out there. Oh my God, so much comparison. I think what was so much of the struggle for me was I knew I was comparing and I knew I shouldn't be comparing, but I didn't know my way out of it. So it was like a double whammy. I was like compounding my pain by wanting to look this certain way because of all the messaging that I had gotten over the years just from our culture. And then I'm compounding it like I shouldn't be this way. I should be able to just accept my body as where I'm at. I should, I should, I should. And so that was a struggle for me. And I love the body positivity movement and I love intuitive eating. But for me, it like 
and this might be a little unpopular, but it's swaying almost too far to one end of the spectrum to where I'm like, I'm supposed to be able to just accept this, but I couldn't, I didn't have the tools to be able to like really love and accept my body and be healthy from like a health and wellness perspective and like put good foods into my body. So I was kind of in this shame spiral of like, okay, on one end, I don't actually feel my best inside my body, right? And I actually do feel like there's extra weight on me that's not serving me. Um, But I'm supposed to just accept this. I'm supposed to just love this. And so I eventually, and I'll, I'll get there, found kind of that middle ground of like being at my natural weight and really loving my body no matter what, which is like, oh my God, I could like cry thinking about it. But the way I got there, which is what you asked. This is like a long-winded um, answer to your question. I love it. Let's go but there. I had my baby, uh, my first baby, um, Luna, let's see, in 2017. So like three and a half years ago. And before I had her, I was like, you know what, Laura, this is just going to be your struggle. I like it. This could bring me to tears too. Like I kind of threw in the towel. I was like, you know what? I'm just, you're just going to yo-yo. You're just going to struggle with this for the rest of your life because you know what? It's not even that bad. Like other people have worse problems, which is also kind of sad, right? But really I was struggling with it under the surface. And so I was like, you know what? This is just going to be your thing. Like whatever. But then I had Luna and obviously she was a girl and I was like, oh, no, I'm not going to be struggling with this. Absolutely not. Something came over me and it was a non-negotiable. I was like, you will heal this. You will heal this now because you will not pass this on to your daughter. This relationship with your body and this relationship with your food is not something that she will inherit. Absolutely not. And it was just like, it, it was almost like out of body. It was like, okay, I'll solve this. Like, okay, let's go. And so I went to work and, um, solved it. Thank God. Because I knew on one hand, like if I didn't solve it, I could like do the right things, right? Or like say the right things. But I know if I didn't heal it at the root, she would get it. Like she would see um, exactly what I was going through. And so I just didn't want to pass that down to her. Um, So on one hand, I felt really lucky because I felt like some some of the tools just landed in my lap. And then on the other hand, I'm like, wait, no, you struggled with this for 20 years. You were not lucky. Um, But I had gotten another certification when I was pregnant with Luna through the Life Coach School. And the founder of the Life Coach School is Brooke Castillo, who has been my coach um, for a long time. And she has a weight loss certification and kind of a weight loss arm. Um, Like I think 15 or 17 years ago when she became a coach, she started doing weight loss coaching and weight coaching. And so um, a lot of the tools that I had been teaching my clients and been using for other areas, right? Like career stuff or money stuff or whatever, I just started applying some of those coaching tools. And we can get into that later too, to my relationship with my body and my relationship with food. Um, And it's so funny because so much of what you and I had talked about and what you had taught me, like started to really sink in. I just, I think I wasn't ready until I had Luna and I was really ready to heal this. And there was just no if, ands, or buts about, I wasn't going to stop until I, until I got to the root and to sit here and to be able to tell you that I healed this while it's still a practice for me, for sure. But I do feel like I healed this. But to sit here and to be able to tell you that like really blows my mind. Like I almost like can't even believe it because I really did think for so long it was just going to be my struggle. It was just going to be my thing that, you know, this is this is the hand you've been dealt kind of thing. Can we talk a little bit more about pretending to love your body and that shame spiral? Because I think you're exactly right. Like... Luna would have saw through that. Like there is, babies are so intuitive and they are little sponges that absorb even the subconscious stuff. Oh my God. Yeah, what's so interesting. Have you ever seen that movie, Sliding Doors? It's like this actress, I forget who it is. And um, she, the whole premise of the movie is she's standing on a platform like in London and it takes her through the train arriving. She gets on the train and she does one 
kind, kind of one path of life. And then another train and another scene comes and she doesn't get on. She misses it. The door slides shut, right? And it goes through two paths of her life. One, she got on the train, one she didn't. And, you know, one, she meets this guy, blah, blah, blah. One, she doesn't, whatever. And I, I kind of got that same sort of glimpse the other day, just the other day in the mirror. I'm standing in the mirror. Luna's in the bath. I mean, <laughs> I'm just butt naked in the near, mirror about to get in the shower. And I just looked at myself like with love and contentment. It wasn't overt. It wasn't like I was shaking my booty in the mirror. Not that I wouldn't do that now. I totally would. But I just kind of caught a glimpse of myself in the mirror. And it was just like my eyes met me with love. But at the same time, I sort of saw like out of the corner of my eye or kind of in the back of my head, this other picture that just ar arose of like, oh, if I hadn't healed this, I would be looking at myself with a little bit, bit of like disdain or disappointment. It would have been so subtle. I would have immediately tried to cover it up, but she would have saw that. She would yeah. have seen that little tiny moment of me just being in disappointment or you know, subtle disgust or whatever it is. And instead she saw me meeting myself with love, which is like, I mean, that's like the most beautiful gift you can give your kid, right? Like, because it gives them permission to love themselves. And that's really at the root of it everything. I'm going to cry. I'm going to cry too. I mean, I mean, it is, it is the most powerful thing as a mom to be able to pass self-love down to your child in a learned way in a way for them and permission to, to fail, to fall down, to make mistakes, to learn, to grow, you know, to, yeah. to, to give them that space, space and arena to get to know themselves and to love themselves. And it is so beautiful because they do teach us that too, like in the beauty of how much they love themselves before the world tells them not to, <laughs> Yeah, you know, and so yeah. protecting that, protecting that innocence and that purity is just, beautiful. And I'm so happy that you, you had the tools through your coaching program and through the birth of your daughter. I think such a transformational moment, especially for mothers to daughters. Like mm. we don't want to pass these things down. You know, um, I don't have a daughter yet, but fingers crossed. Mm. Number three, you yeah. never know. <laughs> um, She's got it. <laughs> yeah. So can you talk to me a little bit about going back with um, Brooke Castillo, doing the weight training program and some of the tools that you started using and implementing? Yeah. Because I think yeah. there has to be women listening right now who this is resonating so deeply with. Yeah, totally. So I think it all clicked because, well, exactly going back to what you teach, right, is it's not about calories in, calories out. And I was so resistant to give that up. Like I couldn't believe that I could just eat a normal amount of food and lose weight. Like I remember starting to eat in a way where I really removed all processed sugars and processed flours and just eating in a much more whole way, exactly what you teach, right? In a way to balance my hormones. Um, and I remember right with right when I had had Luna, I did want to lose that baby weight, right? And I did really want to come into my natural weight and I wanted to heal all of that. And so I started um, removing all that processed sugar and processed flour and I would be eating like big, I even remember you talking about like, I remember like, I mean, this must have been like 2014 or something. You'd be like, I eat like four eggs and like an avocado and like a salad. And I was like, I remember sitting there being like, counting the calories in my hand. And be like, oh, I think I remember you, your like <laughs> reaction to all of that so well. It was fun. Yeah. I'm like, that sounds like what I should be eating in like two days. And of course, now, <laughs> now I, now I eat, eat that way very much. And right at the beginning, I would eat, you know, whatever, four eggs and an avocado and a big, amazing salad. And then like lose weight the next day. And I would be like, wait a second, what happened? I ate a normal amount of food. I wasn't starving all day and I lost weight. This is so like miraculous. <laughs> and backwards. <laughs> so, that, yeah, totally. So that was like the first part of it was just like balancing my hunger hormones and really leaning into the belief that it's not calories in. I'm sorry, I'm getting very animated over here. <laughs> yeah. It's not calories in, calories out. So that was a huge part of it. Um, and then there was the part of like the drama. Well, like, what do I do at the party? Or what do I do when I want to go out to dinner with my husband? I think that I didn't think I was an emotional eater, but I was. Like, I wasn't 
oh my God, I'm so stressed. I'm so disappointed. I'm so lonely. And then I would eat those feelings. I was more of a positive emotional eater, right? Like no I surprise would... there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm like <laughs> eating for entertainment, right? Like the vacation, the point of the vacation was to eat such and such food. The point of the weekend is to go on, the, go to this restaurant. And there was so much that I healed from like a mindset and an emotional piece of like, hey, like life can actually just be about the people and the connection and being present with them. Because when I sit down and I really ask myself, what do I want? I want to be with my friends. I want to be with my family and I want to be engaged and I want to have fun with them. Like really, that's what I want. And so um, reprogramming my brain to see that the weekends are meant for hanging out with my friends and my family and not about the bacon stuffed date with whatever, right? Not about like that, that can be a part of it, but it doesn't have to be the top of the list. And I think it was filling me up on emotional level with like entertainment and fun. And if the food wasn't yummy, like I was bored, right? So I think being willing to be uncomfortable and then having a coach to help me through that discomfort really helped because there is some discomfort when you are moving, the, you're changing your priority list, right? If food is for entertainment and that's number one, and then you're deciding to put that at number five or take it off the priority list, there's going to be some discomfort that comes up and like how to handle it. And so um, I had to be willing to feel restless. I had to be willing to feel a strong desire and not answer it. And so I really learned that these feelings of restlessness or boredom, or even if I did have a funky moment where I did want to eat food because I was stressed out or I had a hard day or whatever, fill in the blank. Exhausted. Um, Exhausted. Yeah, totally. (laughs) Yeah. Especially with little kids. I really realized that like food wasn't going to solve that. Like food wasn't going to solve that problem. Um, And all of these feelings are literally just vibrations in my body and I can handle a vibration in my body. Like a vibration in my body is the reason why I have this kind of like screwed up relationship with my 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 body and food. Like, no, like I can handle emotions. Like it's kind of crazy. A lot of the coaching tools brought the yoga tools and the meditation tools more to life for me. It's like a lot of what meditation and yoga teaches um, but I just wasn't getting it actually like in like on a in the body, in my bone cellular level. And so I think when I really realized like, look, I can change my mindset to put food lower on the list and the people like higher on the list. I mean, it's crazy to me. I remember my coach saying to me like, you know, you could go on vacation and lose weight. You know, you could go on vacation and it could be about the people and not the food. And I was like, you're crazy. Like, no, like, vac- and then I was like, all right, let me just try on this way of thinking. Let me just try on this mindset as an experiment and see if it works for me. I'm just going to try. And I did. And over time, it worked. I think another one of the coaching tools that really helped me is lowering desire. Like, I didn't know that you could lower desire for food. And so we're basically like, <laughs> Pavlovian dogs walking around salivating for whatever the thing is, chocolate chip cookies, or a lot of my clients come to me and they're like overeating like healthy foods, right? Too. So, yeah, happens. So, I just found that um, once I lowered my desire for food and it wasn't kind of off the charts, and I brought it down to like a normal, natural desire for food, that I ate a normal, natural amount. And then I kind of just fell into place when it came to my weight. I just weighed a normal, natural amount. Um, And I really didn't know that you could reprogram desire. And I think that's kind of one of, I don't know, you probably know this, but just as our culture, I feel like it's a, it's a secret, right? Like we're all walking around with a little bit of an over desire, not all of us, but a lot of us in this culture, because of the program we get and the conditioning and the socializing that we get, um, we're walking around with a little bit of an over desire for food. And when we can lower that desire to normal, natural, then it kind of all takes care of itself. Um, I think that's in the same vein of like, hey, food is for fuel most of the time. I think I didn't know that really. Like I was like, oh, wait, this is 
fuel. This isn't entertainment like I was talking about. This isn't a comfort. This isn't meant to be an escape. This isn't meant to be an avoidance technique. This is meant to like nourish and fuel my body. And does it mean you can't go out and have like an amazing creme brulee like once in a while? No, but now because food is 90, 95% for me for fuel, then like I actually enjoy the creme brulee instead of like just eating it on a whim and then feeling super guilty and then trying to like do three workouts and go on a juice funds after it, (laughs) like I used to do. I think that that is such an important thing to highlight because there is such a pendulum swing from binge to cleanse and binge to cleanse, binge to cleanse and people wanted to be perfect, which I've said in my book and I talk about a lot is like stopping this pendulum ball. They want it to stop. They want every day to be just robotic and perfect. And that's technically like saying that your ball would stop. And you pointed out that emotions are vibrations. Like emotions running through your body are going to have that pendulum bouncing off the midline. It's never going to stop. And you got to get used to those small swings of what does it feel like to have that creme brulee on the weekend and not swing it back to some crazy cleanse double day situation. Like, can you move through it in a way, in a space that you're just a light vibration off the midline? And you, you touched on one of the ways that you did that by lowering desire. I'd love to know what, like how you brought that into your life and like how you started to recognize that you had too much desire for food or that, you know, like what, what were those aha moments for you when you were beginning your journey of lowering desire? Yeah, I think for me, it was kind of going back, like food just had way too much um, power. That's a great word. (laughs) Yeah, it had just had way too much power and it was just way too important. The amount of time I was thinking about it Mm -hmm. um, before eating it, after eating it, while eating it was just too much. So I just knew like, this is not, the amount of time that I want to be spending on food. I want to be spending this time on my coaching business, on being with my kids, on being with my husband, on being outside in nature and like hiking or or whatever the thing is that like actually lights me up. I want to be spending that time on true pleasures versus false pleasures, right? Like food for me um, is, food for me is a false pleasure when used for an escape tactic or an entertainment technique or whatever. So I I just started to notice like I'm not using food almost exclusively for fuel. I'm using it for so many other things. Like I said, primarily entertainment and fun and to not be bored. (laughs) Yeah. So, and so that's why I was like, that's how I knew I had a hint into like, wow, I have an over desire for food. And then if you um, kind of zoom in, I could see it just on the day to day. Like I wasn't genuinely hungry. I wasn't physically hungry, right? I was emotionally hungry. And so I would notice those urges for food or those desires for food and notice that. I mean, this is really a meditation, mindfulness practice, right? Like, oh, wow, I'm noticing that I have like a strong desire for food and I'm not hungry. I'm going to talk to myself like really gently and lovingly and with compassion and breathe. And we're going to move through it because the desire, just like we talked about, desire is just an emotion and that's just a vibration. And when we actually let it in, it will pass, right? And it will serve us to not have, you know, for me, it would be like, whatever. My husband likes to have a lot of snacks in the house. So it would be like, whatever, chocolate covered peanut butter stuffed pretzels or whatever that he just left on the counter. And I would see him maybe after having a couple back-to-back meetings and nursing the baby or whatever it was, oh, there are some chocolate covered peanut butter filled pretzels. Those are really good right now, but I know they don't serve me. I feel that I'm having a strong desire for them. But what I used to do was like white knuckle it, right? Like if they weren't on the plan or they weren't on the diet, like I would like, oh my, I would like get mad at my husband. I'd be like, what's wrong with you? I told you no snacks in the house or like, you know, literally get so mad at him. And now I'm like, whatever, have whatever you want in the house. Like I can have my own back here. I think that's a huge part of it too, is like 
I didn't know that you could learn the skill of following through on the word that you've said to yourself or, you know, following through on a commitment you've made to yourself. I knew I was really good at following through on my word when it came to other people. But when it came to food, it was like, I can't trust myself. Like, there's no way. Like, I just can't. And I always remember watching Brian, my husband, he would like, you know, set a New Year's resolution and then like go crush it totally like knock it out of the park on whatever the goal was and he wouldn't even tell me about it he would just like go do it and I would be like what is happening like how do you not have like all these outer accountability like (laughs) parameters or bets or like people that are in it with you and he's like yeah I just like say I'm gonna do something then I would do it and I'm like oh my god you're crazy like you're crazy and then I realized oh no that's a skill that you can learn and you can teach yourself and so I taught myself how to be I mean through coaching tools through my coach too I taught myself how to have my own back and have how to have my word because it was in my best interest and because it served me not from a place of like over restriction or um, deprivation, but from a place of like what I really wanted, which was freedom when it came to food and my body. And, and did I also want to come into my natural weight? Yeah, I did. That was a part of it for me. I'm not gonna lie. Like, and I think that's okay, too. I don't think that there's any shame if, you know, your listeners or you know, my people, they want to lose weight. I think that there, there's, oh, that's okay. I think so much of what's out there is like, you shouldn't want to lose weight. You should just accept who you are. And then it's like, okay, well, let's really look at that and see if that's what you want. <laughs> right. Can we talk about the fact? I mean, I think it's such an important topic right now because you hit the nail on the head. It is okay to want to lose weight. Yeah. Like it is okay to want to lose weight. Yeah. And the world is telling us that it's not okay. Here's where I think we need to unpack it. It's talking about why do you feel that way? Because at a certain point, you found love with your body. And it may not be that weight number that you had 10 years ago that was like, I don't love myself unless I'm a hundred and this pounds or whatever it is. It's the work between what you want and your set weight that makes you feel good. And I think people are missing the point. You understood that you were emotionally connected to food and that it was taking, it was powerful in your life, taking too much time up in your brain. Yeah. Just, just you just marinating in foods about thought, right? Yeah. Or thoughts about food. Yeah. Like that's what people do. And if they're thinking about food constantly, and food has so much power and they're, you know, trying to quote unquote, love their body where they are, but they are obsessed with thinking about food and restricting food, but they're telling themselves they love their body. And then they're binging on the weekend. They don't have a good relationship with food. And it's when the work happens between that space and your goal weight, that your goal weight can actually change. I will tell you, I've had people who say, I want to be a size two. I want to be a size four. And we start doing the work. And they're absolutely stoked on a size six or a size eight yeah. because they're taking care of themselves. Yeah. They're oh doing God. their work. They're getting, taking the power away from the food and putting it into the things that they really love that really fill their cup in the way that it should. Yep. Can I we talk? That, yeah, yeah. I think, I mean, I like love everything you're saying because what I think you're saying is, you can't hate your body thin. Like you have to love your body thin and you have to really love your reasons as to why you want to lose weight, right? You don't love your reasons and they're not authentic, then you might lose the weight, but you'll just gain it back, right? Because you're losing the weight because someone says, oh, you're only a good yoga teacher if you weigh 118 pounds or or you you know look this certain way, right? But if you're like, no, I just really want to, heal my relationship with food in my body. And I do want to lose weight as I do that. Great. Um, I think it also speaks to learning to love yourself. I mean, this sounds so cliche, but really learning to love yourself and learning that like happiness and contentment and inner peace comes from within. It doesn't come from the goal. It doesn't come from hitting 118. Guess what? If you hit 118 and you don't learn to love yourself on the way there, 
you're still not going to love yourself when you get to 118. Like it might be amazing because you like love the size two jeans that you're in now, but you're going to then transfer it to something. Oh, well now I got to go make this amount of money to fill myself up. Oh, now I got to have another baby to fill myself up. I got to get the house. So like you'll be constantly chasing the goal and making the goal responsible for your happiness when that's your job, obviously. Making the goal responsible for your happiness. The goal, we get there, we can only last there first. I mean, that's the, that's the crazy part is people don't realize how your body is constantly changing. Cells are constantly sucking nutrients in and burning them out. And like, we are not a solid state. Like we are fluid. We are emotion. We are vibration. We are, we are ins and outs of all of it. And I love, I love that you give people, people permission to say that they want to lose weight. Mm-hmm but the work is where, where it's at. Can you tell me about some of the things that you started doing in your life to find joy and to give power to things that were outside of food? Mm, yeah, totally. It kind of goes back to like letting it be an experiment. And I think that this is like a cool mindset to adopt when you're trying to slowly release the reins on food as a comfort or as a best friend or as an escape or whatever. Like just experiment with setting your Saturday up. If Saturday is like your cheat day or Saturday is your big day when you <laughs> are gonna, you know, yeah, cheat days. That just like makes me laugh and whatever. All kinds of screwed up nostalgia. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's like experiment with planning all kinds of really fun, true pleasures. So things that really fill you up. A true pleasure, I think, is something that while you're doing it, it's really awesome and it's really pleasurable. And then after you're done doing it, it's still pleasurable, right? Or you look back without any guilt. You look back and you feel like, oh yeah, that really filled my cup up, right? Instead of depleted me or instead of filling my brain up with with more thoughts of guilt or shame or, or whatever. So it's kind of the difference of true pleasures or false pleasures. So for me, it was like, okay, I really love, I mean, I bring up hiking all the time, but now that we're in Colorado, we're always hiking. So I'm like, let's go hiking and let's just experiment with making it about breathing in the fresh air. Let's make it about getting to the top and I don't know, having a big hug or a big celebration or a big picture you know, taking a big, awesome picture up there. Um, Again, it goes back to a little bit of the willingness to be in the discomfort because I'm not going to get that crazy dopamine hit. I'm not, right? If If it's not about the cupcakes or it's not about the fun steak dinner, quote unquote, um, I'm not going to get as big of a dopamine hit in that moment. But... I am going to get what I really, truly want. And I still am going to get a little dopamine hit. Like I still will get a little bit from the connection of being with my family. It's just not going to be as big. And it's like, this gets a little heady, but your, your people know about this. It's like healing all those neurotransmitters, right? And healing my dopamine receptors and training them like that we're going to be doing true pleasures now. We're not going to be doing false pleasures. We're going to be doing things that really fill us up so that we can, I mean, have the life that we want to have. So for me, I really just took a lot of these mindset shifts and emotional shifts as experiments. I'm just going to experiment with letting go of the food for this weekend. Now, my diet brain did not like that because my diet brain wants to be like, no, this is the plan. This is black and white. This is definitely going to work 100%. So when I use the word experiment, my diet brain, which luckily I don't really have anymore, but my diet brain wants to be like, experiment? No, we (laughs) wanted to lose like 20 pounds by yesterday. (laughs) Experiment. But it gave me that like little door to just try it and just see and just like, kind of like you're talking about like one step at a time. It doesn't have to be perfect. Let's let's just try and see what happens. Maybe we're going to like this better. Maybe we're going to have a better vacation or a better Saturday when it's focused on the people and not the food. And so that was like my hypothesis. And then I tested it and I was like, oh yeah, this is way better. This is way better. I'm going to keep doing this. Food can be a drug. It can be what a highly palatable, high sugar. I mean, it lights up your brain like a Christmas tree. So yeah. well, I love that you mentioned that you're not getting that same hit. Um, there, there is a, 
a component there that can be hard to break, like a habit that can be hard to break because it's giving you that immediate pleasure. But what I think you you touched on, which really was an aha moment for me, was that it felt good in the moment and it also felt good after. Yes, that is huge. Because what we think in like diet con- culture and diet mentality is like, it's either immediate gratification or delayed gratification. But what I want to teach my clients is that, yeah, you're not going to get that huge hit of dopamine, but how can we have a little bit of instant or immediate gratification by having, you know, by getting to the top of the mountain or by um, seeing a best friend or whatever and the delayed gratification. Like you have to give yourself something, I think in that moment when you're not having what you would normally have that would give you that big hit, like the chocolate chip cookie or the nachos or whatever the thing is. Um, What else can you give yourself in that moment? I actually have, I mean, this is like really cheesy and people want to laugh, but I have my clients do a little bead jar. So when they... um, when they have an urge for food, right? Something that isn't serving them, something they said that they don't want to have most of the time, like whatever their chips and whatever, their chips yeah. and queso or whatever, or their chocolate chip cookie. And they notice that they're having an urge and they allow the urge versus use willpower against the urge. And they're really talking to themselves really sweetly and with compassion, like we talked about versus being like, what's wrong with you? You shouldn't want that. Instead, they're like, of course you want it. Your brain is telling you you want it. You you you're designed to like want to eat all the sugar all the time. Of course you want it. It's okay. We're not having it right now. And when they allow the urge without using willpower against the urge, I teach them to take a little bead or a penny or a Lego from one jar and put it into the other jar and like make it make a noise. And that actually gives them a teeny bit of a dopamine hit, but it's a positive reward cycle, right? Versus a negative reward cycle, which is super cheesy. And people are like, I am not six years old. I'm not doing a reward chart. And I'm like, just try it. Okay. And now everybody's like, you know, they've got their bead jars all around. Now people are like, I get a bead when I journal in the morning and I get a bead when I don't yell at my kids. And I'm like, Oh my God. These are, I mean, but these are the tools that take what we want and put them into action. And I love that you're parenting your own brain. Oh my God. That's what you're, you're parenting your diet brain. You're, you're letting her be seen. hundred percent. You're letting her be soothed. You're setting some boundaries for her. Yeah. And you're making her feel secure in a home with peanut butter stuffed chocolate covered pretzels. <laughs> yeah. That I 100%. freaking love this, Laura. Yeah. No, it's totally parenting. Like, I mean, it's so awesome that all my clients are moms because they get it, right? And we see that when we discipline our kid, which is exactly what we're doing with our brain, we're just trying to discipline our brain, right? And you guys know discipline means to teach. We're just trying to reteach our brains. We're just trying to teach our kids. So like when Luna smacks Phoenix upside the head, I don't let her off the hook because that's a boundary that we've set in our house. I don't let her off the hook. I'm not like, oh, it's a new day. You won't do it tomorrow. It's fine. Right? Yeah. I don't let her off the hook. And I also don't beat her up, obviously, but I don't like verbally <laughs> beat her up. And I don't, I mean, obviously, physically beat her up. (laughs) But that's the same we don't want to do with our brains. We don't want to beat ourselves up either when we have made a mistake, when we have had the cookie or the chocolate chip or the cupcake or the chocolate chip cookie or whatever the thing is. um, I really want my clients like not beating themselves up and not letting themselves off the hook, but instead disciplining themselves. And like with Luna, I'd be like, you must have been feeling really frustrated. Like that must have been a really hard moment for you. It's okay. I'm here to support you, right? Like let's think about what happened there and what we can do differently next time. It's like literally how I talk to myself when it comes to food that doesn't serve me. And that's how I help my clients talk to themselves, right? I love it because what you've done right there is you've taken the power away. You've taken the power away from the food immediately in that process of like, Yes, of course, you're going to want this cookie. Yes, of course, you're going to want that. Like, duh, you're going to want that. And that's okay. But here's the boundary. We're not going to have that right now. And here's, you know, like, it's, it's, it's okay to move through how you're feeling. And I'm going to, I'm going to stand with my diet brain right now. And you're going to feel secure. And what you've given yourself is trust and safety. And you didn't have that in your diet brain. You didn't have the the security you didn't feel safe you didn't trust yourself around those types of foods yeah. because they were triggers for you they held too much power 100% yeah 
Yeah. And then it was just like this vicious cycle, right? Of like over restrict, over desire, over eat, over restrict, yeah. over desire, over eat. Right. And so, yeah, it's, it's really fun to use the analogy of parenting because I think we so get it with parenting, but we're not trained to talk to ourselves that way. But it's not that hard. We can totally do it. No, we demand perfection in our own brain. And then we try to filter that and not demand it on our children. And yeah. so it's that's healing. That, that whole process of becoming a parent and learning how to parent Luna and Phoenix and parent yourself it's no wonder you were able to heal your relationship with food. It's no wonder that you're able to coach people to do the same. And it's those little actions. I love the beach jar. I'm taking it. I'm using it with clients because we do, we, what I will say is like, it's those positive habits that we prove that we can do to ourselves. It's not changing your whole day. It's not changing your whole life overnight. It's not the 20 pounds you were talking about in a day. It is literally saying, I trust myself to follow through on something and I'm not going to set a goal too big and too big that I can't attain it. I'm going to do something attainable and I'm going to prove that I can follow through and I'm going to trust myself to do it. And I mean, I've seen you, I've seen you do it with your hiking. I like, you know, following along and following the hikes that happen every day and moving your body every day. Like it's beautiful. Yeah. It's really cool to see. Yeah. And you're, you're hitting on like what I think is really just what we want is like when we can build that skill of self-trust, we have like a confidence that is unflappable. Like, and that's all, I mean, and that that's rooted in self-love too, right? But that's all anyone ever wants is just to kind of have their own backs and like enjoy their life and their relationship with themselves. So mm -hmm. I think that's huge, being able to trust yourself and having your own back. It only takes one decision too. It's amazing how yeah. powerful like one decision is when it comes to that. It's like that one day I decided to get on my bike. That one day I decided to hike. That one day I decided to pick the beat up and put it in the other jar, make yeah. myself the four eggs scramble, trust that I was going to be okay. It's those day to days. Yeah. Yeah. But, and our diet brain just hates that, right? They're, they're like, no, everything now, fix it all. And it's like right. one step at a time is actually the path. Yeah. And people get there when they start to finally, finally go to the one step at a time to build their healthy house one brick at a time and build that strong foundation that's uncrackable. Mm, I love that. Yeah, totally. Thank you so much for being here. This is, this is one of my favorite podcasts because we got raw and real around what most women are hiding behind, which is this, I've got it all together, but inside I'm yelling at myself and I don't think I'm good enough and I don't think I follow through and I don't think my body's good enough and the world out there is you know I'm comparing myself to it and I feel unworthy and all of this extends from from the heart and the vibrations inside of you to love yourself but it's to love your body to show up for your partners to show up for your kids to show up for yourself in your business to take a risk People aren't going to take risks if they don't feel like they follow through and have their back. Yeah, no, 100%. Because if they fall or they fail, they're going to make it mean something about who they are as a person or their value or their worth. And wow. That's just not true. Well, where can people follow along? Where, where can they join the Yummy Mummy experience? <laughs> Oh, I love you, Kelly. Um, so you guys can just go to lauraconley.com. My name is L-A-U-R-A-C-O-N-L-E-Y, lauraconley.com or on Instagram at lauraconleycoaching. I love it. Thank you so much. And if you guys are podcast people, you can check out and Kelly's going to come on to my podcast, which is just called the Yummy Mummy Podcast, Lose Weight for the Last Time. I love yeah. it. Thank you for being here and for your time and for your honesty and vulnerability. I know everyone's probably in their cars or running going, yes, yes, oh, I've so been sweet. there. We've all been yeah. there. Totally. To say that we haven't, like, you know. Yeah, no, we're all human for sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much. For, I knew we were going to have fun on this conversation or on this podcast and having this conversation. Thank you. Yeah. Love you, girl. Thank you for listening to Be Well by Kelly. Please subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Learn more at BeWellByKelly.com and follow me on Instagram at BeWellByKelly. I would love if you picked up my books, Body Love and Body Love Every Day. They're sold on Amazon and at all major booksellers. 